So there was a couple of documents that dropped today and or not today. They, they dropped a, a couple of days ago. I just saw them today and we're going to go through them. These are some responses to the February 28th hearing. This says response to public records request. A records a public records request submitted to Lake Tahoe County Clerk on February 26, 2024, and was substantially forwarded to the court review and a response. The request to examine records pertaining to the total cost to date in the case against Brian Coburn to include both defense and prosecution and any other costs in this case as required pursuant. So this is just about getting the public records of how much people make for the most part. In fact, kind of towards at the bottom here, you even see how much that Ann Taylor makes. You know, they they have. And this is something that we've seen before. Uh, orders approving appointed counsel hourly rate, hourly rate says Ann C. Taylor, Chief Public Defender of Coutini County Public Defender Office. I probably butchered that. I apologize. Uh, has been appointed to represent Defendant Brian C. Koberger at public expense. Therefore, it is ordered that Ann C. Taylor is entitled to a payment of her services at a rate of two hundred dollars per hour. Ann J. W. Lawson, Chief Deputy Litigation and the Public Defender Office, will be entitled to payment for. His services at a rate of one hundred eighty dollars an hour. This is all this was was just kind of public record on how much they are getting paid. I was going to the next one. This is when things are starting to get good. So this is an order setting deadlines and hearings based on February 28, 2024 hearing. The court orders the following. Any notice of the defense of alibi must be filed no later than April 17, 2024. If the defendant intends to offer a defense alibi. So they extended it. They extended his defense alibi. His current defense alibi is I was driving around alone by myself. You know, not much of an alibi, if you ask me. Now, the the, the biggest question has been uh, as of late, you know, even this debate kind of sparred up. And the most recent hearing was Ann Taylor wants all the defense. Right. And the prosecution is saying they got and the defense are saying they got about 95 percent of the evidence. There's a little bit of evidence that they haven't received yet. And that goes for both sides. You know, the defense hasn't received apparently some pieces of footage, you know, from during a specific time and also some of the IgG stuff, uh, apparently. And they they wanted some more information on the cast information. Now, they even she even said it. She wasn't going to these things that they're asking may not even you know come up in court. Right. And I was thinking maybe that's the IgG stuff. But I think about it, it might be the cast thing. You know, I don't think the cast thing is going to come up in court. The reason being is it was utilized to get warrants, right? What's going to be used in court is going to be his GPS locations while his phone was on. That's what's going to be used in court to determine because that's going to be the more accurate one to determine exactly where he was. So they haven't given them that. Now, what the prosecution has asked for is his extended alibi. And since he hasn't come up with one and and the defense has stated something to the effect that they will present Brian Koberger's alibi at a later time or even through cross examining of state's witnesses. The prosecution probably feels that the defense is wanting to perhaps maybe could be allegedly fabricating some sort of alibi. Right? think of the Murdoch case where he had said that he never went down to the dog show, the dog kennel. He went down there. You know, his wife and his son, you know, their lives were taken by somebody else. He went down there. He left. He he went to his what do you say, his grandma's house or his mama's house or his mom's house. And when he came back, he found him. And that's not what one, his phone, her phone didn't, you know, at, you know, align to his story. And two, there was audio of him talking by the dog kennel. Now, when he goes up there and takes the stand, like for me, I hadn't heard you know, about this case. That was before I was in. You know, talking about true crime, I saw only a handful of the court uh, of the trial. So I'm, I'm going based off memory and I, I don't know much about it. He goes up there and he talks on the stand and gives this testimony that aligns with the possibility of what the evidence was. Now, at that point in time, I hadn't seen, you know, the the nine. Um, the police videotape where he said he wasn't down there and all this other stuff. I'd only caught on to the back part of it. And when he came up with this alibi, I was like, well, you know, that does kind of make sense with, with what the evidence is, but obviously he's lying because that wasn't what he said in the beginning. I can see how people could believe a fabricated alibi, but even more so it's very easy to fabricate one once you know what all the evidence is. And so that's what they're wanting, right? So they have, an alibi goes back to April 17th. This notice must comply with Idaho section 19519 and shall state the specific place and places at which the defendant claims to have been at the time of the alleged offense and the names and addresses of witnesses upon whom he intends to rely on 
to establish such alibi. A hearing on the defendant's motion of change of venue will be held on May 14, 2024 at 1.30 p.m. The hearing will be in person to the open public and streamlined on the court's YouTube channel. Defendant's brief witness list and any evidence of the defense wishes uh, to present certain uh, support of motion and change of venue must be filed by April 17th. The state's response brief list and any evidence in opposition to the motion must be filed by May 1st, 2024. Now, go back up here real quick. They want the alibi by April 17th, but they gave the state till August uh, to turn over all the evidence. So do you think that the state's going to wait until April 17th to turn over all the evidence? I think so. Let me know what you guys think. You know, do you think the state is going to turn over any evidence before April 17th when it comes to the cast or anything that talks about his locations the night of the incident? And if that bothers you, that he needs to have that information so that he can create an alibi? Well, I mean, I don't know. But I don't know what to say about that. Because that shouldn't be the case. He should be able to come out and say, I was driving around by myself. I left Pullman, Washington, and I went north, east, west, south, somewhere. And then I traveled. I, I passed through this intersection. I was out between two and four something in the morning. Did you get gas anywhere? No. Did you gas up before you go? You know, because it sounds like if somebody's just driving around that entire time, which he was, I'd be low on gas. You know, why did you have your phone off during that time? Now, we don't know why it turned off, but police do. Remember, that PCA came out or was written before his arrest. His phone wasn't searched and gotten the warrants until after that. So we don't know any of that. So all that GPS stuff, they know. And they're also going to know why his phone turned off or if it went to uh, airplane mode or if it lost service. Like so many people hope that that was the case, which doesn't make sense to me, because if you're going to lose phone service, you're going to lose phone service in Pullman where service is strongest. Go through Moscow at a certain point where service is strongest and it's not even connect a little bit. And then it, it connects when you're outside of Moscow in the most rural area, driving in the most rural area of Idaho and, and Washington state and your state connected for majority of the time. That makes sense. Also, it, wouldn't it be weird if he's the only person that had service issues? Jeez, I wonder what happened there, right? Because... I'm pretty sure it'd be very easy to find out if there were service issues that night because he wouldn't be the only one affected by it. Now, would he? I don't think so. Let's continue this. The deadline for the defense's discovery to be turned over to the state, including mitigation, is January 9, 2025. And there it is. Not so good for Koberger, in my opinion. I think that's another loss. And here's some other stuff that's going on. In the district court of the second judicial court district of state of Idaho in and, and for the county of Lato, amended order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order. Based on February 28, 2024, hearing the sealed order of for disclosure of IgG information and protection order is amended as follows. Defense counsel uh, Ann Taylor, J. Longson, Eliza, uh, Eliza Massoff, defendant Brian Koberger, and the IgG defense experts, Dr. Leah Larkin, Vicka Barlow, and Steve and Mercer may view the IgG materials provided by the state. Any further dissemination of the materials or information contained within the materials included to any investigators must first be approved by the court after showing by the defense as to why such individuals need, uh, need the information for the preparation of the defense. Uh, I think this is important because basically what it's saying is if you guys want to send this out to anybody else, because that was the argument. You know, they have some other witnesses and experts or whatever that may want to see it. But they, for some reason, didn't want to name them. Just said that they had them. Remember, it's kind of weird, right? The defense says we have these you know, individuals who we want to see this, but we can't tell you who they are. <laughs> and it's, it's weird, man. It's weird. I don't know where everybody sees the innocence in this guy, but it's weird. So what they're also saying is you have to ask. And not only do you have to ask, you have to provide information as to why you want it. In that last court hearing, Judge Judge finally, you know, started to you know, man up a little bit, drop his, you know what? And he said, why is this? Why do you all need all this information? Basically, how does it pertain to the case? All these and re, these people that are related to Koberger, like how are they going to if you go and talk to some guy that all he did was swab his mouth and send it in to see who his his family members are? How does he how is he involved in this quadruple homicide in Idaho? It's not. And that's where the judge is like, where's the relevance in this that you want the names of all these people, all these people. And, and at the end of the day, the IgG didn't point or didn't match Brian Koberger. You know, the IgG guys didn't go and take the DNA off the sheet, take a buccal swab uh, out of Koberger's cheek, test them together and say, hey, 
it's a match. Oh, and that was the Iowa State line after his arrest. Remember, they got a warrant for it based on the warrant that they had by picking his dad's trash up, which is completely illegal, too. That's the stuff that they're going to use. So this entire argument is just kind of pointless. Additionally, no individual in the family tree who was not previously known to the defense via the defense's own investigation may be contacted by the defense or any agent of the defense without prior authorization of the court after showing us why such contact is necessary and material for the preparation of the defense. The defense mitigation expert who has created her own family tree and who does not have access to any of the IgG information may continue her mitigation investigation, including contacting defendants, immediate family members and other related individuals. So they're just kind of limiting who they can contact to the immediate family members of Brian Coburger and, you know, anybody who's related to this situation. I'm assuming if, you know, we talked about how there's a possibility that one or more of Brian Koberger's family members maybe did speak up and fully cooperate with law enforcement, as they indicated in their statement, I believe, that they fully cooperated with law enforcement. Maybe if she had a boyfriend, husband, fiance or something like that, who's not directly related, but also been in the area, or even if they did have a, a cousin or an aunt or uncle that did go over and actually saw Brian Coburger maybe perhaps running around with his gloves on inside the house, you know, separating trash and all, not being weird at all. The accused is entitled to know how, question mark. The accused is entitled to, you know, defend himself. The accused is entitled to all of the evidence that either points towards his guilt or exonerates him. If it's just random stuff that they did, like for instance, on November 25th, they, on that's the day that they found something, November 20th, you know, they saw somebody in a white Elantra. They followed that person and that person, you know, drink was drinking a soda can through the can in the trash can. They go in there, pick it up, go back, test it and come back as a match. You know, they're not going to see that. The defense isn't going to see that they did that. There's no point that doesn't have anything to do with anything. So they only get certain things and also the things that are going to be used against him. You know, the IgG isn't something that's used against him. It's also not something that hasn't been used before. The Golden State Killer was caught this way. Michael Kimmy came in with a 999 super chat saying, Ann Taylor slipped up and said the video of Brian's car, not the white car, but Brian's car. Brian is so guilty. She's trying to find a technicality alibi to be presented 30 days post arrest. I agree with you 100%, Michael Kimmy, 100%. And I'm not, well, I'm not going to say he's guilty because he hasn't been found guilty. I will say that I think he did it. You guys can say he's guilty. Nobody here is on a jury. And I don't think anybody should feel bad if they think that the dude is 100% innocent or 100% guilty. That's your opinion. Who cares? It's your thought. I, I struggle to find the logic in some of the stuff that I read when it comes to the defense of Brian Koberger. You know, there are some folks that do have some pretty strong arguments. You know, the one thing that has popped up that that's kind of weird is the fact that Dylan wakes up at 4 a.m. while Brian Koberger is still driving around. Well, let's see. Is that what Dylan said? Because Dylan could say, you know, I woke up and it was around four o'clock. That's her saying it. That's not necessarily law enforcement saying that it's for you. DM stated she originally went to sleep. Yeah. See right here. DM stated she woken up at approximately 4 a.m. So that's that's Dylan Mortensen's statement. That's not what the police are saying that she woke up. And it's also saying approximately to be different. If it stated that police stated that they had seen, you know, something at 4 a.m. And then also he's on camera at 4.05, then, yeah, it's different. But this is Dil Dylan's statement and it's approximation. I don't think it's supposed to mean that 100 percent accuracy. But that is a good argument. You know, that is out there until court comes and trial comes. We're probably not going to understand or know the, you know, the accuracy of that until then. And when that day comes, we're going to know exactly what time or more or less what time she woke up. Cause I'm assuming, you know, if she heard some noises, she may have, you know, looked at her phone and, and then yelled, you know, most people do that. I, when I wake up in the middle of the night, I look at my phone, I'll see what time it is. And then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get up or whatever. But you know, is that, you know, a lot of people think that she was texting back and forth with Bethany and, and it's possible. I have no idea, no idea whatsoever. But what the PC says uh, about the time that this happened states because of the download of their phones, not because of text messages that they were sending. So the download of their phone is going to show them a lot of things like when it was you know, laying flat, when it was moved, when it got moved forward, when it was activated, when it was connected to the network, whether it wasn't was connected to Wi-Fi. It's going to have a bunch of information on there, not just the text and calls. You know, you can't be narrowly focused here. You have to open up your view there. Glenda says the prosecution interviewed 400 witnesses and 
and Taylor has 400 witnesses to interview. That doesn't mean they are BK witnesses. I believe she said that they were 400 defensive uh, defenses witnesses. When it comes to somebody who's gone through clear trauma and is invisible shock, because that's what I understand how she looked. You know, a lot of people think that she was just this cold blooded person that walked out there, got in the police car, chilled down in the back, went to the police station, was kicking back in the seat, just kind of saying, hey, guys, you know, I'll sleep. I heard some noises. I woke up. I saw a guy and I went back in my room. That's not how it's not how it happened. You know, we only know like what, five sentences of her entire statement. And we haven't even heard, you know, how she was talking. All right. We're, we're getting pieces of what she said from the police officer. And the rest of it is the police officer's words articulating what occurred. Right. And so that's why it sounds like it's flows like that was the only thing that said but that wasn't she was there from from what i understand like one o'clock or not even that. i think it was like 12 whenever they called uh i don't think they got released until about 11 or 10 o'clock that night because that's around the same time that jack d got released and from what i understand they got released when well, i don't say released they, they left and from what i understand it was almost about the same time that they, they left from my understanding hey what's up true crime web He's going to be coming out on Wednesday. Steve's going to be coming up on Wednesday, guys. You don't want to miss this one. Uh, we're going to be looking at evidence. Uh, we're going to be looking at the footprint evidence. So what Steve had done, he did an experiment wearing booties, stepping in blood, stepping in blood with just shoes, stepping in blood with booties and walking with the booties on, stepping in blood with the booties, taking the booties off and then walking after the booties were on. If there was any saturation of blood through the booties that got on the footprint. So we're going to go through all that on Wednesday. You don't want to miss it. So make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. We have to remember that Dylan gave a statement after she found out what happened to her roommate. So whatever statement she gave was probably frantic and all over the place. From what I understand is she was pretty hysterical. And some of the, th the things that she was saying, they didn't make sense. Like she was like gibberish is what I heard. Uh, apparently, Bethany, from what I understand, passed out. But then hopefully she'll testify at trial fully composed and lucid. I mean, if you were in her shoes and something horrific happened, that would be a, a, a scary situation to sit there and the person that took the lives of your friends inside of your home while you were in there potentially could have been you is right there. I mean, you know, to think that there's no trauma or anything like that. I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a while. It's, it's been a while. So hopefully, you know, it's 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 going to be a while too. We won't plan on seeing this until next year. But go watch the uh, celebration of life that they had, and go watch Hunter Johnson talk. You know, he's Ethan's best friend. He saw what happened. You know, he was one of the guys from what I understand that that was called. He went over. He saw, and and he he's the one that called nine one one. And so, if you go listen to the way he's talking, fluid and composed. I don't know, man. I mean, I think your expectation might be a little bit too high for somebody that's been through something. I know, like, for instance, my wife, she had her her leg cut down down the bone, like almost in half. She was um, her dad's a plumber and she was working with him. They were messing up the floors with the uh, jackhammer or whatever. And the mirror vibrated, fell off and it cut her down the leg. You know, this was like eight years ago to this day. She can't get near mirrors. You know, it only took her life. You know, she's fortunately she was able to put a tourniquet on her leg. Ambulance got there just in time to to help her and 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 get her going. People have some PTSD and, and like it's been eight years for my wife and she still gets real nervous when it comes around to some big mirrors. To say Dylan Mortensen should be fluid and and composed during her during her testimony is pretty effed up, to be honest with you. You know what I mean?